Hi, welcome to Ethereum Mechanics video number 12. And this, we're going to discuss the mass paradox. Um, this is what I consider to be a mass paradox. I don't know about regular science. Uh, this is for general audiences. Uh, in this video, we're going to show that inertia must be decoupled from mass just as weight was decoupled from mass. Otherwise, we would have a paradox. To explain what we mean by weight being decoupled from mass, for those people who don't know, let's go back into history. Back in the old days, we used weight, the weight of something, as a measure of the quantity of something. So, for example, this uh, three-inch brass cannonball weighs about 4.3 pounds at sea level. Okay, but if I take this cannonball to the moon, it weighs a mere 0.7 pounds. And so scientists realize, well, gee, we need to decouple weight from mass. Uh, because the quantity of brass didn't change, but the interaction between the brass and the, the massive body that was holding it down, whether that be the Earth or the Moon, did change. And so they invented the, the thing called mass. Mass is a quantity of stuff, such as the number of atoms that make up this cannonball. Okay, and when you went from the Moon to the Earth, the number of brass uh, atoms of zinc and copper in the brass cannonball didn't change, but the weight did. So that's why they have to decouple mass being the quantity of something from the weight of something. So where does the mass paradox come in? Well, if we take this brass cannonball and we shoot it near the speed of light, okay, according to Einstein and relativity, its mass is going to increase by this factor here. So if you take the rest mass and divide it by this Lorentz transform factor or whatever, or maybe it's multiplied, I remember, um, then you'll see the mass changes. But that's confusing. If mass is the quantity of atoms, of copper and zinc atoms in the cannonball, then what happens? Is there more zinc atoms and copper atoms being formed as this thing travels at the speed of light? No, that can't be. That's ridiculous. Okay, so what we truly have here is not a case of mass changing, it's a case of inertia is changing. Okay, let's put the cannonball off to the side for a moment. Okay, so what we need to do is we need to define inertia as separate from mass. And so inertia is going to be a function of mass, velocity, and other properties that we'll discuss in later videos. Um, and if right now we're going to still use the, the units of inertia to be kilograms. Even though we really should change it to something else, I propose a unit of burls, such as in Burley, but uh, I don't want to cause confusion now, so we're going to stick with that the units of inertia are still going to be kilograms like mass, but it's not mass, it's just the units. So what do we learn from this? Inertia is changeable in spite of the fact that the mass is constant. If that's the case, then inertia is not an intrinsic property of mass. So if we believe Einstein's principle of equivalence, and if you don't know what that means, follow along, Einstein said that if you're on a spaceship and you're accelerating at 9.8 meters per second squared, which is the, for the acceleration of gravity, you cannot tell the difference if you're accelerating or if you're standing on the Earth. So if that little space capsule is just sitting on the Earth, you cannot tell the difference whether you're sitting on the Earth or accelerating through space at 9.8 meters per second. This is a case of weight and this is a case of inertia. Therefore, inertia and weight, Einstein said, are essentially similar or equivalent. Okay, so if we believe that is true, then if the weight is the product of the interaction between two bodies, then inertia must also be the product of the interaction between two bodies as well, if they're equivalent. So we're going to surmise that all matter must be composed of inertialist particles which interact with other particles to generate other inertialist particles to generate the property of matter that we observe like weight, inertia, structure, electricity, magnetism, light, etc., etc. Okay, because we've shown that inertia is not an intrinsic property of mass and if mass is similar to gravity uh, according to Einstein then inertia and weight must be decoupled from mass. Uh, inertia must be decoupled from mass just like weight is. So as ethereal mechanics progresses, we'll show that gravity and inertia are electromagnetic induction um, uh, between inertialist particles. 
And if you want some previous work on this, this is uh, obsolete by made obsolete by Ethereal Mechanics. You can go look at these documents. Now, in these older documents, we use the term massless particles. Uh, that's uh, an oxymoron by today's standards. Uh, but eventually we're going to show through ethereal mechanics that all matter is composed of inertialist particles. Okay, uh, this, is a disc uh, this is a disclaimer. We're going to go under the assumption now that mass is conserved. In other words, the massless particles that create matter are not destroyed or created. Okay, and this is, these are the disclaimers I'm making right now to that event. So we have some changes to physics. It's no longer force equals mass times acceleration. It's force is equal to inertia times acceleration. The minus sign will become apparent in later videos. Uh, potential energy is not, no longer mgh. It's inertia gravity height. Kinetic energy is not one-half mv squared. It's one-half inertia times velocity squared. And E equals mc squared is now equal to inertia times c squared. Uh, as we go on, the force of gravity is really the acceleration of gravity times the inertia of the two bodies divided by the magnitude of the distance between them squared. But don't let your brain squirm on this. It'll make more, more sense as we go on. Uh, these new forms we're not going to be using right now. They're going to be uh, introduced much, much later. The reason for that is we still have a lot of classical physics to discuss. Uh, and it's easier to explain classical physics with, with conventional terms that the majority of people understand. And also, we don't want to cause confusion for people that start in the video series in the middle. So what's next? Um, next, we're going to do Newton's conundrum. And we're going to do three videos on Newton. Then we're going to have an antenna paradox video. Uh, my uh, antenna uh, engineers, um, you may want to check this one out. Faraday's folly, I'm going to cancel this video. I don't really need to go back and disprove Faraday's law. So I'm going to skip that because I really want to go ahead. I don't want, I don't want to keep on uh, dwelling in the old stuff. This is going to be introduction video to new induction and new magnetism and the V3 models. Uh, ethereal mechanics, we're going to release a newer version of new electromagnetism, which is V5. We're going to have a, then uh, video 19 is going to be an introduction to the luminiferous ether and Michael Morley uh, to discuss what happened before, what the old model of the ether was that this new ethereal mechanics is replacing. Uh, this actually begins ethereal mechanics, video number 20, with the reciprocal thinking and this video you do not want to miss. This is going to be the most important 15 minutes in history in my opinion. Uh, as we're going to show a property of matter uh, that we humans have become, gotten completely wrong about. Uh, so, all hail the mighty cannonball. Thank you.